This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael dot Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Six Modern Times. Book Six, Chapter Four Columban. Some weeks after the conviction of the seven hundred piratists, a little, gruff, hairy, short sighted man left his house one morning with a paste pot, a ladder, and a bundle of posters and went about the streets pasting placards to the walls, on which might be read in large letters, Pyro is innocent, Molbeck is guilty. He was not a bill-poster. His name was Columban, and as the author of sixty volumes on penguin sociology, he was numbered among the most laborious and respected writers in Alca. Having given sufficient thought to the matter, and no longer doubting Pyro's innocence, he proclaimed it in the manner which he thought would be the most sensational. He met with no hindrance while posting his bills in the quiet streets, but when he came to the populous quarters, every time he mounted his ladder, inquisitive people crowded round him, and dumbfounded with surprise and indignation, threw at him threatening looks, which he received with the calm that comes from courage and short-sightedness. Whilst caretakers and tradespeople tore down the bills he had posted, he kept on zealously placarding, carrying his tools, and followed by little boys, who with their baskets under their arms or their satchels on their backs were in no hurry to reach school to the mute indignation against him protests and murmurs were now added but columban did not condescend to see or hear anything as at the entrance to the rue st orborosia he was posting one of his squares of paper bearing the words pyro is innocent maubeck is guilty the riotous crowd showed signs of the most violent anger they called after him traitor thief, rascal, scoundrel. A woman opened a window and emptied a vase full of filth over his head. A cabby sent his hat flying from one end of the street to the other by a blow of his whip amid the cheers of the crowd who now felt themselves avenged. A butcher's boy knocked Columban with his paste-pot, his brush, and his posters from the top of his ladder into the gutter, and the proud penguins then felt the greatness of their country. Columban stood up, covered with filth, lame, and with his elbow injured, but tranquil and resolute. Lo, brutes, he muttered, shrugging his shoulders. Then he went down on all fours in the gutter to look for his glasses which he had lost in the fall. It was then seen that his coat was split from the collar to the tails, and that his trousers were in rags. The rancor of the crowd grew stronger. On the other side of the street stretched the big St. Orborosian stores. The patriots seized whatever they could lay their hands on from the shop-front, and hurled at Columban oranges, lemons, pots of jam, pieces of chocolate, bottles of liqueurs, boxes of sardines, pots of foie gras, hams, fowls, flasks of oil, and bags of haricots. Covered with the debris of the food, bruised, tattered, lame, and blind, he took to flight, followed by the shop-boys, bakers, loafers, citizens, and hooligans whose number increased each moment, and who kept shouting, Duck him! Death to the traitor! Duck him! This torrent of vulgar humanity swept along the streets and rushed into the Rue St. Mail. The police did their duty. From all the adjacent streets constables proceeded, and holding their scabbards with their left hands, they went at full speed in front of their pursuers. They were on the point of grabbing Columban in their huge hands, when he suddenly escaped them by falling through an open manhole to the bottom of a sewer. He spent the night there in the darkness, sitting close by the dirty water amidst the fat and slimy rats. He thought of his task, and his swelling heart filled with courage and pity, and when the dawn threw a pale ray of light into the air-hole, he got up and said, speaking to himself, I see that the fight will be a stiff one. Forthwith he composed a memorandum, in which he clearly showed that Pyrot could not have stolen from the Ministry of War the eighty thousand trusses of hay which it had never received, for the reason that Maubec had never delivered them, though he had received the money. Columban caused this statement to be distributed in the streets of Alca. The people refused to read it, and tore it up in anger. The shopkeepers shook their fists at the distributors, who made off, chased by angry women armed with brooms. Feelings grew warm and the ferment lasted the whole day. 
In the evening, bands of wild and ragged men went about the streets yelling, Death to Colon Man! The patriots snatched whole bundles of the memorandum from the newsboys and burned them in the public squares, dancing wildly round these bonfires with girls whose petticoats were tied up to their waists. Some of the more enthusiastic among them went and broke the windows of the house in which Columban had lived in perfect tranquillity during his forty years of work. Parliament was roused, and asked the chief of the government what measures he proposed to take in order to repel the odious attacks made by Columban upon the honour of the national arm and the safety of Penguinia. Robin Milieu denounced Columban's impious audacity and proclaimed amid the cheers of the legislators that the man would be summoned before the courts to answer for his infamous libel. The minister of war was called to the tribune, and appeared in it transfigured. He had no longer the air, as in former days, of one of the sacred geese of the penguin citadels. Now bristling with outstretched neck and hooked beak, he seemed the symbolic vulture, fastened to the livers of the country's enemies. In the august silence of the assembly he pronounced these words only. I swear that Pyro is a rascal. This speech of Great Hawk was reported all over Penguinia and satisfied the public conscience. End of Book Six, Chapter Four.